Welcome to That's All Right, Broncos. I'm Brandon. My only Miami vice right now is that I'm going to sit through three hours of this fucking game, Perna. That in whiskey, of course. Now, we're about to see two teams on wildly different trajectories. The Dolphins started the season one and three before turning it around quickly and have won five games in a row, which puts them just a half game out of a division they haven't won since Chad Pennington and the Wildcat in 2008. The Broncos, well, they're just bad right now. In terms of overall talent, I think the Broncos actually have the edge against the Dolphins. The problem is that half of that talent is on IR. The Dolphins, on the other hand, are very healthy and they are sure about their young quarterback while the Broncos are trying desperately to figure theirs out. And the Dolphins are led by an incredible coach who wins no matter who the front office gives him. Which has been a lot of different players. I wish the Broncos had that kind of resourcefulness. Right now, they feel like a team of 53 square pegs being jammed into 53 round holes. Or as the kids call it, a Minecraft sex tape. Broncos Dolphins. Whew. That's good, that Broncos. Please subscribe to That's Good Broncos, the YouTube channel. We've got like two Broncos podcasts we post here every week, the prediction episodes, and if you want to hear the podcasts in your ears only, subscribe to where subscribe to That's God That's God Broncos. Maybe I should change it to that name to help Denver. Subscribe to the That's Good Broncos podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget my friends over at DNBR cranking out Broncos videos and the best Denver merch with my code Perna you can get a discount at DNBR Locker. If the last couple weeks couldn't get any more depressing, we get a front row seat to see what a great young quarterback looks like. And unlike Justin Herbert, this one only knows how to win. With a victory, Tua can become the first rookie QB since Big Ben Roethlisberger in 2004 to win all four of his first starts. Tua has gotten better just about every week, using pinpoint passes and probably the best slant throws I've seen to lead a Dolphins offense whose job is being made more and more simple thanks to great play from the defense and special teams. It's a whole ecosystem working together. In order to appreciate Tua, uh, you need to watch the Dolphins football games because his stats are not impressing anyone. I mean, he needed nearly 250 yards and two passing touchdowns to beat the Cardinals a week after demoralizing the Rams with less than 100 passing yards in the win. I can't think of a bigger statement as a young man in the NFL than handing the opposing team an L with less than 100 passing yards on offense. Tua's complete lack of interceptions is what's helping him develop on the fly. I think after a rough debut, he's been better than his low grade in pro football focus. Uh, they have him just above Drew Locke. The QBs graded uh, lower than Locke, Nick Mullins, Sam Darnold, and Joe Flacco. A former Broncos QB and two guys Broncos fans have mentioned as replacements for Drew Locke, which makes me wonder, as fans, do we just want pain? Drew Locke, on the other hand, has lost his last four starts, and last Sunday against the Raiders was by far the worst game of his career. Technically, he had a lower passer rating against the Patriots this season, but just two picks in that game, uh, a bunch of drops, and of course, Brandon McManus to help him win. Against Vegas, we witnessed four interceptions, and he didn't even have the last ditch garbage time flurry of yards and touchdowns to make it at least look better on the stat sheet. Stat sheets live forever, Drew. Those 2.06 air yards per attempt will haunt you forever. The good news is that Drew Locke might not even play due to a clavicle strain and bruised ribs. All Broncos fans are actually currently on the injury report and questionable to even watch this game with similar injuries. A bruised ego and strain vocal cords from yelling at our televisions. Now I'm not suggesting we move on from Drew Locke forever. 
I just think this would be the perfect week for him to get a break without having to deal with the stigma of being benched. I love everything about Drew Locke, except for the way he's playing football right now. And I don't know how to fix it. A week off means Brett Rippon could get the call for the second time this season. Rippon won his last start against the Jets, throwing two touchdowns and also three picks, but somehow looking pretty impressive in the process. And some have suggested that Brett Rippon runs Pat Shermer's offense with more efficiency than Locke. I guess we'll find out Sunday. I don't have any sort of illusions that Tua and Drew Locke are going to switch roles this week. I just want to see the Broncos defense try to capitalize on the fact that this is still a rookie starting just his fourth game. Do what the Dolphins defense did to Justin Herbert and simply dance around at the line of scrimmage so the quarterback gets so scared he runs to the worst barber immediately following the game. If this is what Justin Herbert looked like before and after the Dolphins game, what do you think that Miami defense is going to do to Drew Locke? Maybe Locke's injury is just a ploy though, so he avoids this type of self-harm. I'm scared he may never have the courage to dance again. If Locke plays, my hope is that Drew Locke tries to prove that last week will forever be his low point and that there's a chance he can dig his way out of this hole. Because the simplest route to Denver being good again is through Locke. And maybe Pat Shermer being shown the door where Drew can lock it shut on this ugly chapter in Broncos history forever. Broncos offense versus the Dolphins defense. Jadavian Clowney, TJ Watt, Chris Jones, Tyron Matthew, Joey Bosa. Out of all the great defenders the Broncos have played this season, there is nothing that can prepare this offense for the menace that is Andrew Van Ginkle. My dream for this game is that this matchup become a 60 minute chess match a la the Queen's Gambit between the two Drews, Locke and Van Ginkle. I want Peyton Manning versus Ed Reed levels of back and forth and mind games. Andrew Van Ginkle has two and a half sacks this season as a rookie, but guess what? I wouldn't be surprised if he blitzes the A-gaps a few times against Lloyd Cushenberry and ends up with seven sacks by the time this game's over. Earlier this week, I saw an article that said Drew Locke's injury is forcing the Dolphins to prepare for three different quarterbacks. Whoever wrote that article has not watched the Broncos this year. Broncos quarterbacks may have different names, but they're all playing basically the same. That's like, Someone having a really hard time deciding between Bud Light, Miller Light, and Coors Light at the liquor store. They're all pretty much the same and will get you the same type of drunk you need to be watching the Broncos offense in 2020. Of course, the Broncos will have to deal with Xavier Howard, who the Dolphins are probably thanking their Floridian god they didn't trade in their hard rebuild fire sale last year. That made me wonder, what if this team still had Minka Fitzpatrick? They traded him for a first rounder last season, which turned into offensive tackle Austin Jackson, who's been on IR since October 9th. So the immediate results are undecided. Uh, everybody seems to be praising the rebuild as the reason for the Dolphins' success, but it seems like they're winning in spite of the rebuild. They've gotten zero return since trading a defensive player of the year caliber safety. They still haven't used all of the picks they got from the Laramie Tunzel trade. And they got Tua with the fifth overall pick, who was the guy they wanted when they were clearly trying to get the number one overall pick. So maybe tanking isn't so great. They might be even better had they not done it in the first place. All of that is purely a testament to Brian Flores, who in my mind is the very obvious pick for head coach of the year. I think he's safely the only coach in the NFL who can still look extremely intimidating in a vest. Then we've got the Broncos defense versus the Dolphins offense. We've already talked about how efficient two has been the last couple of games. Uh, what I have yet to mention is the one weakness the Dolphins do have. 
It is their rushing attack. It feels like Brian Flores has gone through as many running backs as Kyle Shanahan this season without the same kind of production. Ryan Fitzmagic, who hasn't played in three straight games, is still the Dolphins' second leading rusher. He also boasts the highest average for any Dolphin with more than 15 rushing attempts at 5.4 yards per carry. Fourth string running back Salvin Ahmed got the majority of the carries against the Chargers. Miami released Jordan Howard recently after the back failed to average more than two yards per carry at any point this season. He did have four rushing touchdowns though, which is three more than Philip Lindsay who still averages 5.5 yards per carry. Now I mentioned Kyle Shannon earlier because both Matt Breda and Salvin Ahmed were undrafted selections by Kyle, who are now in Miami. Breda is returning from a hamstring injury and at some point he, uh, Ahmed or Gaskin need to sort of separate themselves as a leading back for the Dolphins. The Broncos strength on defense right now is their secondary. Assuming Vic Fangio's curmudgeoned old Tukis doesn't bench O.J. Mudia in favor of starting a much worse corner, and that Devontae Bosby comes in and plays very reliable football. The Raiders beat Denver by 25 points by gaining over 200 yards on the ground. Carr only had 154 passing yards, and I know Tua isn't picking apart any defenses yet. That said, I think Devontae Parker is one of the best receivers in the game, and if Miami remembers Mike Gusecki is actually the best tight end on the team, he could be a problem for the Broncos. And Shelby Harris is most likely out again this week, so I am not optimistic about the Broncos being able to stop the fifth worst rushing team in the league. Here are my X factors for Sunday. Dolphins fullback, Cox Chandler. If he drops the C on his last name, he'd be Cox Handler. Cox Handler. Jerry Judy has been getting open against everyone. Xavier Howard has been locking down anyone who dare challenge him. Someone is going to win that matchup. On my prediction, on paper, probably Howard. On the All-22, when we see how many times Jerry Judy was open but not thrown to, Jerry Judy. And the biggest X factor may be field goals. Jason Sanders and Brandon McManus both seemingly won Special Teams Player of the Month on my birthday in the month of October. The NFL eventually decided on Sanders as the true winner, but that has not stopped DenverBroncos.com from leaving this graphic up. Both kickers were perfect in October. McManus 10 for 10 on field goals, Sanders 11 for 11. McManus, however, did miss one PAT, but he literally was the only guy to score for the Broncos in their win over New England. He also averaged 43.2 yards per field goal to Sanders 36 for the month with four kicks over 50 yards. Throw in the fact that McManus has soaked more panties with his array of fits than fits himself or hell any hurricane to hit Miami. And as perfect as Jason Sanders continues to be with the boot, I will take the king of the gooch every time. My prediction, Dolphins win this one 29-21 regardless of Locke or Rippin getting the start. Come on, Drew, I'm pulling for you, buddy. Thanks for watching That's Good Broncos. Again, subscribe here on YouTube to That's Good Broncos for more Broncos content than you can handle.